Hello, everyone, and welcome to this 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, uh, this online event. Uh, tonight's event is called Anti-Racism for White People, and it features uh, Jordan Cantwell and Daniel Haugi. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada, and we are all glad that you are here. Um, I will introduce our featured speakers in a moment, but first just a little bit of background about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. Um, this is a 40-day program uh, that's running right now um, with daily uh, written reflections. Uh, each day features opportunities for learning, faith reflections, and ideas for action. All of the writings were written by people from the breadth and diversity of the United Church and from a range of backgrounds and identities. And all of these reflections are being posted on the United Church's website one week at a time. In addition to the daily reflections, there are these 40 days live events. And these live events are running each Tuesday and uh, each Tuesday for six weeks and they're being recorded so they can be viewed at any time. And there are also discounted anti-racism books available from the United Church Bookstore. Each week there's a different book featured and this week's book of the week is called Wait, Is This Racist? A Guide to Becoming an Anti-Racist Church. And the discount code uh, for it's called the discount code of 40 days um, in, enables anyone to receive uh, discounts of 20% off books, orders of two or more books up until November the 30th. So we hope you might uh, explore some of the books uh, and all the ways in which you can participate in the 40 days of engagement in, in addition to this live event. And now on to our featured speakers. So Jordan Cantwell uh, uses she, her pronouns and was the 42nd moderator of the United Church of Canada from the years 2015 to 2018. And she currently serves as part of the ministry team at St. Martin's United Church in Saskatoon, on Treaty, 6 on Treaty 6 territory. She was part of the first iteration of the anti-racism common table of the United Church. And Daniel Haugi uses he, him pronouns, and he is originally from Washington State in the US, where he spent 10 years learning and serving in interracial faith communities in Seattle. He then moved to Boston, where he completed his PhD, studying the psychological dynamics of white normativity in progressive institutions. He is now an active member at College Street United Church in Toronto and is a new member of the United Church's Anti-Racism Common Table. So a warm welcome to Daniel and Jordan. Thanks very much. No, thank you, Adele. So friends, I'm just going to start with an apology. I am still recovering from a rather nasty bout with COVID. So <clears throat> I might mute myself from time to time to have a good cough. Um, I apologize if I don't mute myself fast enough. Um, I muted myself. muted myself while I coughed. <laughs> so um, I've lost track of how many... Oh, we've got almost 70 of us on today. So that's very exciting. Um, and we, we want this as much as possible to be sort of a, a dialogue and um, a very participatory time together. Um, Dan and I aren't going to spend a whole lot of time sort of talking at you. We're hoping that we're going to have conversation um, as a whole group, but also in some small groups. And so, and we actually want to begin um, with some small groups um, in a few minutes. And what we want you to talk about in your small groups is um, what are some kinds of situations, like if each of you can think of one, um, a kind of situation that you encounter um, that continues to present you with some questions or some concerns or something that confuses you. Um, when it comes to sort of like racial justice, race relations, racism. Um, and I, I will we'll give you a couple of examples that, that from our own context. Um, so to, to kind of get the creative juices flowing. So one of the, the questions I continue to have or, or struggle with how to do well is um, music in like intercultural music 
in a congregation which is, um, in my context, very, very white, not exclusively white, but very, very white. And um, when we try to sing stuff in any language that isn't English, I get a little pushback. Although I know that we have people in our congregation for whom English is not a first language. Um, I, you know, so I, I, and I, and I know that it's important that we want to sing music um, that's from a variety of cultures um, with different kinds of tunes and energy to them. Um, and I struggle with, so do we, do we sing them in their original language? Do we not? Are we butchering songs from other cultures when we do that? Like if we don't really, if we don't have somebody from that culture who can teach us how to do it well, should we be doing it? But if we don't do it, then we're just singing, you know, what I would call the all white hymns all the time. So I, I struggle with how, how to do music in an intercultural way in a congregation that is itself not particularly intercultural. So that's one. And I'll just um, <clears throat> give an example, but also give a little bit of context for uh, myself and just to, like what I'm speaking into. I also kind of want to name right now, like the, the, the topic and the focus of this section is anti-racism for white people. So as, to white, as a white man myself, when I think about issues that either confuse me or whatever, I'm definitely speaking, you know, as what confuses me as a white person uh, moving into anti-racism work and trying to be a uh, better anti-racist. That's not necessarily going to be the same of what confuses or perplexes, you know, someone who's racialized, someone who's indigenous. So, um, so on the one hand, I just kind of want to be upfront about the fact that part of the focus of this session is going to be, you know, kind of speaking about anti-racism for white people and from white people, but also recognizing that we're not all white people who are gathered here together tonight. And so there's gonna be different angles and different ways of looking at that. Um, part of my own experience or like what I bring to this or where I learned, began learning a lot is um, when I was a member of an interracial congregation in Seattle, Washington, um, and it was, you know, party was kind of heavily with like young professionals and, and a lot of uh, students, college students, was kind of like the economic demographic there and was primarily East Asian and white, that particular congregation. I was on leadership <clears throat> and I was both invited by our pastor, Eugene Cho, at the time and by others within leadership to look at the possibility of starting a church plant in Southern Seattle, which is a, a more racially diverse section of the city. Um, it is not as uh, high like urban professional, but it is also in the process of being gentrified. And so there was a more or less a racially diverse small group of us who are starting to meet about six people about the, pro the prospect of doing a church plant. And I also had a few connections of a couple of churches who were already uh, had decades of ministry uh, in the southern part of Seattle. And as I began to kind of like, I decided I wanted to, you know, take advantage, make use, there's some colonial language right there, of context that I had uh, in, in that part of the city and started having conversations and asking, you know, what would be helpful, what would not. And the primary response I got was like, well, why do you feel like you need to be here at all? And so part of my own reframing of how I even thought about, you know, what I'm doing as, as a white man in ministry who cares about racial justice is, you know, what is even the role for myself being present in a particular place or in a particular part of the city? Um, over the course of those conversations, we actually made the choice, our small group, which was not exclusively white, but was nevertheless, you know, moving from one part of the city to another. We made the decision to not do a church plant per se, but we did move and we did start kind of like a cell group with the intention of getting to know the neighborhood better and learning a bit more about what it might mean to incarnate presence. That's all by way of context. I am getting to my example, I promise. 
So one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of learning, and I was also, you know, spending some time going to another interracial church, which was predominantly African American and white in that part of the city. And as I got to befriend people, as I dated someone from that church, um, increasing questions of like, well, you're sitting amongst yourselves in this group trying to learn about a neighborhood and just having like, you know, you as a white guy, you know, doing this teaching. Um, what does that even say? What is that even accomplishing? And so in response to some of that feedback, I got the bright idea, well, we should invite leaders of color from the community to come in and speak to our group. That also got some interesting responses in terms of like, well, what does it mean exactly to invite someone who you haven't built any relationship with to basically come represent their racial group or represent their community in a way that can obviously be extremely tokenistic. So as a white man doing the, you know, wanting to be engaged in this kind of ministry, I do still wrestle sometime with what is the balance? When is it the right time for me to speak or for me to act or to advocate? And when is it time to leave that to, to make way, to step back, to sit back. When does sitting back actually put more burden on friends and colleagues of mine of color? Or when does that stepping back actually necessary in order to reduce the, the, the power, the salience uh, of my own voice? So again, just speaking from my own individual perspective, I think those kinds of dynamics um, is something that, that, I've, that I've wrestled with. Um, and that I kind of throw open to the group as an example. Thank you, Dan. So friends, we want to invite you to think about your own context, your own questions, the, the places where you have um, bumped up against um, maybe questions that are similar to these or maybe very different, uh, where, where you it's still unresolved for you. You're still not quite sure um, how to move forward in a good way in that context. And our, our tech wizards are going to put you into small groups of four or five people. And you'll have about 15 minutes in those groups to discuss. The, so what we want you to talk is hopefully each of you in the group will have an opportunity to bring forward your question. And then as a group um, to just discuss, like, does that question resonate with anybody else in the group? Like, is that anybody else sharing that concern? Um, and has anybody in your group um, been in a situation where you've actually seen a helpful response uh, to that question or that concern? Or is there collective experience or experience within your collective um, that might provide some insight to that. And maybe there is and maybe there isn't. But hopefully you're able to have that conversation about um, each of the, the issues that you bring forward. It, we're not asking you to like come back with a solution to any problems. We're, this is about having conversation and, and wrestling together. And maybe we learn some great stuff or maybe we learn like, yeah, here are some real sticky points that we haven't figured out yet. Um, but when we come back to the whole group, we'll ask each group who wants to, to have somebody from their group just share one of um, one of the, in a brief kind of way, what the concern was and um, either, and it remains an open question for us or, and somebody offered this helpful response that we all thought, yeah, we'll do that next time. Um, so that's, and, and if you find 15 minutes is too long, feel free to come back early. And if a whole bunch of people are coming back before the 15 minutes is up, then we'll close the room down, the rooms down early. Um, but you've got the whole 15 minutes. You actually have 15 minutes plus 30 seconds because at the 30 second mark, um, you'll get a little warning saying, the room is going to close in 30 seconds. Um, that gives you an opportunity if you are still talking to just make sure whoever is still going can wrap up. You don't have to come back 
immediately, it, you'll automatically come back after that 30 seconds. So is that clear for folks? Oh, and I'm supposed to tell you to all unmute yourselves now or you'll get unmuted so that you're unmuted when you're, otherwise you're gonna have trouble unmuting yourself when you get to your small group. So, <clears throat> yeah, you use the little, everybody know how to unmute? Mm -hmm. Bottom left corner of your screen is a little thing that looks like a microphone. Make sure it has no red line through it. And um, then uh, the wonder of Zoom will put you all in groups. Welcome back, folks. Back, everybody. <laughs> everyone they all just instantly appear back in we're all in and ready to go so, um, welcome back everyone um, we are going to go ahead and ask uh, everyone to go ahead and mute uh, now that we're all back um, and what we want to do, I mean, hopefully you had um, some generative experiences in your groups. You might have had some awkward experiences, might have had some good feedback and conversation, but we really do kind of want to leave it open, um, particularly perhaps if there's someone in your group that you kind of elected to represent, or if not, if there's just any of the comments within what you talked about in terms of like questions that white people have or questions that people have about why do white people always do this or that or the other. Um, and we do ask, I see we've got, um, I see we've got a hand already and that's great. We are really going to ask um, people to go ahead and use the reaction uh, button just with the number of people we have, that's just gonna be the best way to make sure that people can speak in turn and we're just going to be monitoring that and um, making sure we're getting to as many people as we possibly can to share. And so I think we can go ahead and start out. Uh, so did you want to just be clear to use the reaction button to raise your hand? Raise your like hand. If you click on reactions, it'll give you an option that says raise hand if you want to speak. And it'll put you in a queue in the order that you do that. And then we'll call on you. Where's the reaction button? Okay. It is on the bottom. So on the bottom row, and hopefully it just shows up. It's um, it's kind of like the one, two, three from the left. It's the button. It says reactions, and there's a little smiley face there. Um, but if you click on it, then there's an option to raise your hand. And if there are no buttons along the bottom of your screen, move your mouse, and they should show up. Okay. Over at the top. Depending or on. they might be, yeah, depending on your device. And if you're on an iPad, you might have to swipe this way or that way to find them. And if you're on a phone, well, God love you. Because uh, they, they could be anywhere. Doing our best. Okay. So it looks like uh, Kent has a hand raised. So if you want to go, Kent, if you can go ahead and unmute and uh, give us your feedback. Yeah, I hope I'm not the only one to speak. Um, I'm not sure whether our group, and uh, we, we sort of went slightly off question perhaps, but uh, we spent our time generally grappling with an understanding or trying to understand how with history, how Aboriginal peoples and other peoples can embrace uh, Christianity in spite of the missionary and colonial past. And so we were we were talking about, about that. I, I'm not gonna provide what we, sort of came up with, but uh, that was the question we were dealing with. Thank you very much for that. Does anyone else have a, have a hand? And if there was something in your group that Okay, um, next we have Shannon. Uh, if you want to go ahead and unmute and share what you have to say. Hi, um, our, our group had great stories and uh, I kind of got voluntold at the, in the last few seconds. So um, my issue that I brought to the group was um, 
uh, I, a confessional that um, as a minister in uh, both affirming congregations and in congregations that are wanting or who are are working towards anti-racism, my I don't like my default. My default has been to turn to and ask like BIPOC folk or queer folk to kind of uh, take on the emotional labor of um, teaching and leading. And uh, yeah, I have, I, should, I confess I have realized my bias and I got to unlearn and relearn. So that's my issue. Thank you for that. If it's absolutely, if you're trying to raise your virtual hand and you can't find how, how to do it and you really have something to say, oh, look, there we go. then, then, um, yeah, you can always course. unmute yourself and say it if there's another pause there. But we've got Phyllis. Can, that's, well, we can be flexible with the format if we need to be. But yes, looks like Phyllis is up next. So, yeah, in our group, we talked about a couple of things. One was the fine line between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. And the other was being a white person and how to, um, how to approach um, people who are um, not white to try and establish um, a, a relationship, how to have a conversation without being viewed as in, with suspicion or being viewed as, oh, you are from the colonial power that um, perpetrated all of this stuff, it's all your fault. Um, how to how to walk in those um, narrow spaces. Thank you very much, Phyllis. Um, just for people's information, I am kind of trying to note, take, take these down a little bit um, as we go. So as we continue on in the conversation, um, we can get back to some of those things. Um, I felt like there was another hand at one point after but it's it's down was did someone have a hand up and ah uh, yes yes deborah yes i did have my hand up but i was going to volunteer oh there she is one of our group members to ask carol if she would speak about what she shared with our group because i found it was quite interesting so carol would would you There she goes. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and go with Carol if, if you're willing to share. Um, so our anti-racism group at Islington United Church is doing a representation project uh, starting in January. And we are um, attempting to evaluate from an anti-racist anti perspective all of the images from children's uh, materials in Sunday school all the way through um, the music we sing and, and the, um, oh, the communications we send out on, on uh, internet, that sort of their website and all that sort of thing. But one of the issues that's already been raised um, and <laughs> we haven't begun yet is um, around the stained glass windows the church is 200 years old. Um, we have had five male white ministers in our history. And I think we've figured out a way that's sort of acceptable to different groups of taking those portraits and, and downsizing them into a, a leather binder and putting it in the library with the history of the church. Um, so that's one solution that we've come to. But when it comes to the stained glass windows, they are all um, white images of historical fiction, um, of historical men 
or of um, of angels or whatever. It just is all white. And so there's already a divide, which I haven't really stepped into yet, about should they be replaced or should they be repaired? Um, all the stained glass windows have been donated by families. So that gives another, that's another level of the, the issue. So, um, so this is pre-beginning of this project. <laughs> we, I'm already um, into a, a divide. I just wonder, uh, you, you know, it's, um, maybe um, one of the reasons those um, are standing out so much is that there's um, maybe not a balance and, um, you know, things don't change overnight, overnight. And what I've found is that if you start introducing, um, for example, either like the odd picture in the church that uh, depicts people of color. I mean, I grew up in a church where Salzman's head of Christ, a white man, was, um, you know, what I pictured Jesus to look like. But I know more and more now we're recognizing that he probably was more, uh, more a person of color. Um, so, but I think if we have some balance in, you know, rather than worrying about those glass windows initially so much that people get more comfortable with seeing um, people of other races or the banners that are, we have some beautiful banners and if they depict something that invites people of color or an Aboriginal um, person or, you know, that kind of thing, I, I think it, it really, um, it really makes things, it helps to develop the, the trust and the confidence in people to move so that they don't have to be afraid that everything's going to change more quickly than they're ready for. I don't know if that helps. Thanks. One, one, thank you, Jane. One thing that we do want to be able to be doing also is to, you know, offer feedback um, and wisdom, you know, from the group in terms of how you've seen these issues play out or uh, suggestions that you might have um, and share amongst mm -hmm. ourselves. So that's, that's very much in line with what we, what we want to do. So thanks very much. Um, I've heard I've uh, gathered, we've got a note that um, Janice Gillespie, I think has been trying to, um, trying to, to work with the, with the reaction and, and has something to share. Is that, you just, don't have to, but. Yeah, thank you. No, it was just, it was a reaction to some of the first comments that we've heard. I'm sure we've had similar discussions in, uh, in a right. lot of the groups, but the big okay. part about sort of who should do the leading of this discussion of doing the anti-racist um, work. And I could see how this other person was, was struggling with that. And um, actually on the screen with us now is a lady that I was, with a group and Helen McKay is here. We were in a uh, understanding Black Lives Matter group. We kind of that started by uh, Eleanor Scarlett in um, um, a church in Bolton um, at the time after George Floyd's murder. And um, that was our big, big um, question is, is, okay, so here's this little group of mainly white people. Eleanor's black, but you know, only white people there with her. And who, who leads the discussion. So we did bring in a former student of mine who was black, not with the idea of, I think we've got to get past the point. I think we do it out of respect. I like to, if I'm discussing something that involves black people, I think that I'm out of respect saying to them, can you tell us what's your perspective on us? Tell us, what do you think we should be doing? How should we be learning? But that's, we've been told by my friend, former student Damon that we brought on that that's not what they want. They just comes back to us about white people need to do the work. You need to learn. You need to educate themselves, not to ask them for the answers. And I think that was, or even 
the questions. We don't even ask them for the questions. We need to dig through and, and read and learn and figure out for ourselves what are the questions that we need to be looking at. I'm sure everybody in the groups were, were struggling with that. But we also, when our group came up with the, um, at the end of it, realizing that moving to action is often where things get stymied, where we get really stuck. We can do all kinds of learning. We figure we've studied, we've done listening, we've watched documentaries, we've read books, we've talked to people, um, we've brought black people in as we can with it, speakers, whatever. Now what? And that's the part I want to hear where other people are coming up with your suggestions. We had a couple of ideas in my group, but I'd love to hear if other people got to that part as well. Thank you. that uh that question that now what um that's actually we're not going to segue yet but that actually uh will be uh, a great segue uh into the second half for the second portion of our of our discussion together because that's something we really wanted to focus on um in the meantime though i see marcy has a hand raised so thanks um uh, two things. One, I wanted to just get some clarity from you, uh, Daniel and Jordan, about how you would like the chat be used, um, because I see some conversation evolving, and that could be really helpful, or that could be not how you want to um, have that happen. Um, but I think as we're engaging in conversation, uh, I'd love your facilitative direction on that. Um, uh, on another note, I, I think one of the things to recognize in this conversation is, is where do we begin? And we're all in different contexts. And so where we begin is going to be different. Um, but, um, but, you know, where for some folks uh, having, you know, a couple images of people of color so that we don't upset people too much is, is a big step. For others, that feels really minimalist and, and tokenizing. Um, for some people, sort of having a, a Black person come in um, to a conversation feels like a big step. Uh, for others, that feels, again, tokenizing or inappropriate in terms of a method. And so I think one of the things that would be helpful for me in this conversation is that when we're talking about actions and solutions, uh, that we contextualize those a little bit. Um, so I'm just gonna throw that out. Thank you very much. Um, I have an idea. Uh, Jordan, do you have a thoughts in terms of the chat really quick in terms of that issue? Or? Um, go ahead if you were going to jump in with one. My only thought right now, like it's inevitable that people are going to want to chime in and use the chat. Uh, I, you know, I often do that with Zoom. I think uh, given the number of people that we have and the time that we have, I think we are going to focus on addressing in the group people who raise their hand and who speak. So you're welcome to use the chat, but given the constraints of, of time and the amount of people we have, uh, I don't think I will be draw or bringing from the chat into the, the larger group, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and, uh, Marcia, I was just gonna say, I really appreciate your, your comments about um, context and, and uh, it's, Absolutely, that is true. Like the racism is lived out on the ground in real lives, in real places by real people, uh, in in unique contexts. Um, and so, you know, talking sort of just coming up with a, a one size fits all um, solution to any issue about human relationships it's just never going to work um and so so we can learn from one another's experience but yes context is going to be everything and and there are things that um for a congregation or for a person who's just 
you know, putting their toe into anti-racism work um, for the first time is, is going to be radical and huge. And we all get to look back and go, huh, well, going forward, I'm going to do that differently. But we can't even get to that point until we've done it, until we've done something that we can then reflect on. Right. So there, it's not like there's absolute rights. And I mean, there are some absolute wrongs, um, but but it's not like that. There's not like the perfect thing. We have to wait till we have the perfect way forward before we take the first step, because there is no such thing. And we will never get to the next step we need to take if we don't take the first one. And so for all of us, um, this is work of um, tr with our best intention and having done our, uh, our our background learning as much as possible, we take what, what feels like the most faithful step forward, and then we reflect and we reflect and we listen to the feedback and, you know, and, and then we discern and then we take the next step and, and we will get things wrong. Like that's just, of course we do. It's like in a marriage, like if you waited for, everything to be perfect and you were never going to have any conflict before you said, yeah, I'm in. Well, we'd all be very, very, very lonely, right? So we, we go in, we do our best. We're going to have to ask forgiveness. We're going to stumble. We'll get up. We'll learn better. We'll take another step. We'll keep going. So thank you for that. And, and where what that next step looks like is very context dependent. So thank you. I can just add a couple uh comments and then we'll see if the hands are starting to go down so i think i'll just add a couple quick comments and then we'll start moving into our our next topic um the the challenge or that the tension of you know how important it is to for me to learn from voices of color versus the importance of me doing the work and not putting emotional labor burdens on friends and colleagues who are racialized or indigenous um, is a real tension. And, but it's one, it's one that, you know, over time, you know, the only idea or not conclusion, but just that I was able to draw is that that's, that's just life. <laughs> that's the way it is. Uh, in my, in my church context, which was a, in Seattle, which was an interracial church, which was fairly evenly balanced between um, white people and African Americans, with um, a, a bit of other uh, ethnic and uh, indigenous groups represented, which is relatively rare. I mean, you often have, you know, a lot more of one. But in that context, you know, what I what I found, I had was able to build relationships over time. Uh, with friends of mine who, who, friends of color, who eventually, you know, were willing to kind of share things, uh, share, um, even teach me some things or call me out on some things. But that was a very long process. Um, and building trust takes a long amount of time. And I think one thing, um, well, two things. One is coming just coming to accept the fact that um, people are going to mistrust me and be suspicious of me, and they have good reason to. And it doesn't necessarily reflect on my intentions. It reflects on all the assumptions and all my habits. All the, you know, sometimes I try to tell people, you know, uh, the racism that comes from us often isn't found necessarily in our intentions. It's found in our assumptions. Now that that's not necessarily true across the board. It's often found in our intentions, but. Um, but it often can just come about what I take for granted, what is as easy as the air I breathe, because I grow up and I was psychologically and socially formed in a white supremacist society. So um, there's good reason to be suspicious of me. And the, the way to is to go ahead and sit with that and to just work toward learning those things that I need to interrogate in myself. And the other thing is that, you know, there's a lot of books there is so much on the internet <laughs> like you know there there's so much um in terms of you know it's it's one thing that's really helpful is you know to read authors who are established in my own context you know reading someone like james cone a black liberation theologian was very transformative for me but there's also you know for each person who in, for me to not put a burden on an individual a racialized person who i know there's 10 others who have the same 
irritations, complaints, frustrations with white people who has put that on an article on the web somewhere. So one thing that I've <laughs> encountered a lot is, you know, when I'm asking those white person questions, you know, sometimes the response was as simple as like, Google is your friend. So do, and that sense of showing, being willing to do that kind on our own first as a basis for then starting to move into relationship and conversation um, has, has, has gone a, a long way. Um, I am not seeing hands right now. I want to make sure someone's not being, uh, who wants to speak doesn't get the chance. But if I don't see another hand really quick, um, Jordan, would you like to introduce our next or our final section with, uh, with the metaphor you shared with me? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you everybody for for that rich discussion, for sharing those questions and tensions and um, your insights around those and the, those places that remain unresolved. And that that's part of this work is it just never ever gets tied up with a nice little bow and we can say, yay, we're done. Um, so living with that feeling of things are not fully resolved and I don't completely get this yet. That's okay. Get really used to that and really comfortable with that because that's lifelong. So thank you. Um, we wanted to, to kind of address that. So, so then, so now what <laughs> that question of some now, what, now, what do we do? Um, and to, to sort of frame this time, we wanted to, um, Harken back actually to a metaphor that was brought before the general council in uh, 2018, uh, where it talks about a meal, a family meal, or or a, a community meal, and thinking of of worship or or our life in the church as a community meal, and um, wanting the the guests like. Ha so if if that's the metaphor, if our life in community in the church is like a big community meal, um, then here are some questions for us to ponder. Who are the folks putting on the meal? And who are the guests at the meal? And if there are guests at the meal, who has the sort of authority or position to invite guests and to welcome guests who provides the food at the meal and um and and what would it look like if there weren't inviters and guests but if if everybody belonged in an equal kind of way so, so let's start with the, when we think about church and we think about um, seeking to be a, an inclusive kind of community, um, that, that banquet, and Jesus often talked about the kingdom of God in relationship to a big meal, a banquet. Um, we're not going to do exegesis on those parables to see what they really meant, but uh, meals and church have gone hand in hand. And so as we think about that, uh, I, I remember this came out when Dan and I were doing some planning because I was at um, a gathering of United Church of Christ folks and um, somebody talked there as well about church as this meal, um, as did Paul at our gathering, um, and, and lifted out that um, while it's lovely to be invited to a meal, um, that is hosted in somebody else's home. That's a very different experience um, to be a guest in somebody else's space, being served somebody else's food um, and, and all that goes along with that. That's a lovely thing, but that is not the same as feeling like you are in your space and your food is also on the table and you have eek equal sort of status and belonging around that table. There's a, it's a very different power dynamic and a very different um, uh, feeling of comfort when this is your table or this is somebody else's table to which you have been graciously invited. And, 
and often in the church, in the uh, in in um, white dominant church, um, the sort of moves towards trying to be a more um, diverse or inclusive church uses a lot of the language of inviting and welcoming others into ours, or to create a, a welcoming space for others to come in. Um, but then, what are we serving, and who is serving it, and who? Who gets to? Is it a potluck? And is every and and whose space is it? Whose table is it? So those are some of that. That's the metaphor that we want to put out there. And then the question that we have is, what would it really look like um, for us to co-create a radically inclusive spaces of real belonging, not not of of guests and members, but of mutual community, where the gifts and the the food, as it were, from each person's context is welcome and received and shared and where everybody has that sense of this is my table, too. So that's the frame for this section. Again, we want to um, have some space. Maybe we won't go into small groups because we've only got about half an hour left. But if people have... Um, experienced uh, church context or a worship context where it it felt like hmm yeah this this is that kind of community um, we want to hear about that or, or or if you've experienced if you if you've moved your context or you've been in a context that's moved a little bit in in the direction from you know being a church that simply invites to a church, where people really belong. Um, what helped you move? How'd you, how'd you move? This is where you get to use your raise hand function again, because we want to want to hear. From, and actually, you know, for some of us, if you hold your hand up long enough, it will put your hand up. But mine's not doing it. But maybe yours will. Um, do folks have folks had experiences like that, or is this like, ha ha? Here's the big work of the church because we haven't tasted that yet. We haven't sat down at that table. I suspect some of you have. Kent. Yeah, just. Nobody else is jumping in, but I, I, my brain's working on the congregational level. It's also remembering things at presbytery level. Um, and I'm hoping that we're improved now uh, in our current regional council. But certainly, uh, oh, it's wonderful having these, these ethnic congregations uh, but boy, they, 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 they have to follow the manual exactly the way it was written. Of course, the manual is a very, yeah. Um, I don't know that I need to go much farther. It's, it's, it's white people's work rules, uh, the way it's all structured. And yeah, I, the, the, the manual wasn't written, uh, certainly the, the, older one wasn't written. I haven't studied the newer one as, as I should have. Uh, but the older one, certainly everything was supposed to be motions and this and that. And uh, I was working with uh, the congregation in and uh, going, okay, great. We're all agreed on this thing. Uh, now, Presbytery wants a motion. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. Yes, Kent, we are operating within a system that has all kinds of polity and policies and structures in place that are rooted very much in colonialism and in white culture. And it, yeah, so so it's not like we there's a step we can take and bada beam, bada bum, we're done. We got it. It's going to be a whole lot of little baby steps, isn't it? Yeah. Jane. Yep. Um, so I when the lady talked about putting things in context. I've lived in uh, three provinces in Canada, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, and uh, 
Ottawa, in Ontario. And um, uh, when I married my husband, um, he's a black man in Nova Scotia, and he also was a lay minister. Um, so as a young bride, I very quickly went to um, one of those communities in Nova Scotia. Um, black communities are set up like Aboriginal communities are in other places. And um, I found that initially I was welcome because I was the wife of, um, but as I got to know people and they saw that I could be a part of their community, um, that things changed and trust developed. And I think it's very hard. Um, so in, my, in Manitoba, the same thing happened, only it was in my work life with Aboriginal people, Aboriginal foster parents. Um, my experience now is in an all white church. And um, I just, I find repeatedly um, where so many of the things that we're used to doing um, leave out people of color, whether it's Aboriginal, Black, Asian. Um, one example was um, our church invited a Black man to come and speak, but they didn't check the one Black member of their church, who was my husband. Um, you know, anything about how that man associated in the Black community. And um, so we were caught in a bind of somebody who absolutely experienced a great deal of jealousy and nastiness toward my husband, um, because that happens in minority groups as well as white groups. And, um, you know, having to show love and caring and everything. And I think we did that okay, <laughs> but it, it, it was very difficult. And my question was, why wouldn't they have checked with my husband before they in, made an invitation? Um, another thing, last Sunday, I looked and our church um, has the, um, uh, the rainbow flag up front. We also fly it outside. So outside, it had the chevron that included black or people of color. Um, but inside, sitting right in front of the two of us for that service, was a rainbow flag who did, which did not include people of color. And, um, you know, I know we're starting and we're trying, and that's really, really important. <sighs> But we can't expect to go from um, churches that have, n have not wel welcomed Black people. And it seems like the United Church is fairly large on that. And don't, don't get me wrong, I love, I'm, I'm absolutely at peace in the United Church. But it has largely been, or at least where I've been, has largely been a white church. And so we can't expect to all of a sudden change overnight. And we have to, I think, work very, very hard. But there are some, there are some small ways to just get started. So for me in that church, as I'm understanding more and more about um, gender differences and embracing that, area of my life, which was, you know, it was pretty blank before. It would have really helped me if I'd seen um, the color, the, the welcoming of people of color on that flag in my church as I sit with my husband in the church. But we're so busy accepting him as, I don't know, it seems like the token black, that we forget that other people coming into our church might feel uncomfortable because of because there's nothing that 
if we're an all white church that allows for that feeling of acceptance. Um, so many of the conversations that I have, if I, as gently as possible, try to point out something, it seems like the conversation back so often is um, trying to prove that it, it wasn't, um, I hate using the word racist all the time, but it wasn't leaving out um, as opposed to just sitting and hearing when somebody attempts to point out some of the things that have happened over the years um, to people of color. And certainly that's reflected in our Aboriginal um, people as well. Um, where I have, in good faith, tried to be the best that I can be and the most caring, it seems to get reciprocated so easily. And um, that's a pretty wonderful thing. Yes, I've talked too much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Jane. And and such such an important reminder, you know, again, that that the steps that are in front of us to take are um, very contextual, <laughs> depending on where we are and what the step is, and and that a step that all of us can take, um, that is sometimes one of the hardest ones, is when we are challenged, when what we've done is, you know, something is brought to our attention, rather than becoming defensive, is to just hear, to listen, to listen deeply to the concern that's being brought forward. If we're not invested in being perfect and having done it right, then we can actually be open to hearing how we can do it better next time. And so I really appreciate that wisdom. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, I see your hand is up next. Ian, you're going to have to unmute yourself for us to hear you. I should have known that. I'm casting my mind back about 40 years uh, when I first encountered the United Church. And um, Kent's comments about presbytery, I noticed he's turned his head quickly there. Kent's comments about presbytery and the rules and regulations we had in the church have caused us, I think, and it's my contest, contention that it's caused us many of our problems in the sense that when I went on later, and I, I have to say I, I was blessed by having some really progressive ministers around me, but when I went on later to become myself uh, a minister in the United Church, um, the one thing that, that got me was we, we boast about being the whole people of God. And that means something to me. It means a huge amount to me because we are all God's people. Um, and we come as, as we saw last Sunday, I think it was, communion. And what used to happen in some of the churches that I attended, not by my doing, I say, was that when it came to communion, the host was offered to only those who were members of the United Church, that children didn't receive the host or in some cases received the bread, but in most cases received the blessing. How separating is that? It gives a terrible impression to somebody perhaps who's gone to a, a new congregation, um, perhaps not their own, uh, uh, their own stream of ministry and is refused communion. And how positive is it that somebody is given communion? Um, and I, I live with a family that has both coloured and uh, uh, white uh, people within it. Um, they get on famously together, but they don't go to church. Sad. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for the reminder. And, and I saw that echoed in the chat, 
or mentioned also in the chat that the, the table is God's table. And we are all God's guests. And so good for us to remember that. Thank you. you should remember it. Um, Karen. Uh, I also am thinking about communion and um, remembering when I first came to the church that I am now serving. And um, one of the practices um, uh, was to serve not only juice, but wine. And the story that went along with that was we have some people in this community who came from the Catholic Church who find that um, more meaningful to them. And stories like that about why we do things um, because someone came to the church and because it mattered to them uh, as part of their spiritual tradition um, were shared. And so there's um, a way that um, the story of the church or the um, story of the table is a story about how um, what people need and what feeds them um, is part of um, how it has come to be what it is now. Uh, so that idea of um, it's sort of a metaphor for me that connects with the metaphor you were raising about um, who are the folks putting on the meal, who's the guests, who's the hosts, um, and to hold that um, in conversation and through storytelling has been, it was helpful to me to see a community. Um, how can we be a community that can hold that uh, with a kind of um, openness and uh, an evolving kind of uh, spirit, I guess, listening. And it it has helped me to, when new folks come, to be asking, you know, what matters to you and wh what's your place at this table and um, to share that story and to be in that conversation. Awesome. Thank you for that really concrete example. And, and that really important um, piece of it, which is telling the story, keeping the story alive about how this came to be and why, um, because that also uh, works against <clears throat> the whole sort of, well, we've always done it this way. Well, no, we actually, we didn't do it this way. You know, um, we changed. We changed because new people came and that for them to take their place here, we all changed. And that's what we've done in the past. And that's why who, why we are who we are today. And so that's what we can do today. And we'll be who we will be tomorrow because of that. Such that, that our story of our collective story of faith often carries with it, if we remember it and tell it and bring it forward, the seeds that we need um, to grow into who we wanna be. And unfortunately too often, those stories get lost and it's just like, well, that's how we've always done it. Guaranteed. You've never always done it that way. So how did you, how'd you start doing it that way and why? That's great. Wonderful. Sorry. Thank you. Any other experiences that, that people have that, that mm -hmm. were on a Zoom call? What do you need? Well, whoever, that somebody's unmuted who, there you go, who wants to mute themselves. Thank you. Um, if not, really appreciate um, all of the sharing, all of the, and, and, and I encourage you to, to keep having, like, keep thinking about this, because I suspect that you actually have probably um, along the way been in a church service or a, a community that maybe felt um, a, li a little tiny bit closer to the kingdom of God than some of your other ones. And so even just reflecting on, huh, what was it about that? Why did, why did I feel a little bit more, a little more kingdom here? Um, because it, it is, it's baby steps. It's baby steps, uh, you know, and sometimes it's great big leaps, but those, those great big leaps have always been, you know, supported by a whole lot of baby steps to get us ready for the big leap. And so um, this is lifelong work, folks rarely comfortable, sometimes not fun, sometimes deliriously fun, always life-changing. So thank you for engaging it. Daniel, I'm going to give you the last word from us. Um, no, and thank you everyone for participating. And 
My apologies that we weren't able to hear everything and address. There were many um, important uh, topics that I'm sure you've thought about or even that showed up in the chat that are um, that need to be addressed and we can't address everything. But I guess I was reminded um, a little bit of an anecdote, but uh, when I was in Seattle, I worked with or I volunteered for a, a, a Christian organization that worked with street youth and they were in the process of examining their own whiteness and the whiteness of their leadership and um, uh, systemic racism within the organization. And they brought someone from my church, um, a man named Ernie, who was black and who has done a lot of this consulting work with organizations. And he came in and the director of the organization, a woman who is white, uh, and sh she shared this story. She shared this story of, of the movement of this organization and said the first thing that they did is they took, you know, a survey or had a discussion, a cohort discussion of the racialized uh, people in the organization, in the, on the staff. If they could get together and if the organization could do anything, what would they do? And they came up with a 12-point plan. And it included very structural things. It included, you know, interview questions for any new employee. What's your experience with anti-racist work, with, um, with inclusive communities? You know, ways of, you know, looking at who was on staff, who wasn't. Um, ways in which we approached the work with street-involved youth. And she said, the director, after one year, she met again. Uh, with the consultant and she was feeling so proud because they had really made efforts at doing every single one of those 12 things on the list. And she said the next step that was taken was to, again to for the people on staff for racialized indigenous people on staff to get together to talk to assess and Ernie took the results and gave it to her and she said the result now was a three page single spaced document full of more issues problems, suggestions, demands from the group. And she started, she said her first um, first response was, was to tear up, just like, you know, I thought we'd worked so hard and gone these 12 steps and uh, implemented them in the organization to the best of my ability. And just, and that here's this cascading, you know, huge document of all these, about the interrelationship between staff members, about how different kids are getting treated or not treated on the on the subtle ways who gives a ride to who you know from an event to whatever and Ernie said his response was well no it's just now they trust you doing that initial work generated enough trust that now we're willing to be honest with you so there is a sense for white people, for racialized white people, you know, people race, racialized white in this white supremacist society for this process to sort of feel like kind of a hike with a lot of false summits. Uh, false summit is when you're hiking and it looks like you're finally at the top of the hill and then you get to that top and then you see the hill and the hill after that and the hill after that. The reason it's like that is because of centuries of white supremacy. Where it's a long way to climb out because it's a huge hill that our ancestors have dug. So that is, that's the work. And so I, I thank you all for being here and uh, you know willing to be part of that work. Uh, if you're not white, being willing to listen to white people work through this stuff, that can often be an annoying and frustrating process. So um, I thank everyone for, uh, yeah, for being here and just continue to share and network with each other. So thank you. And thank you to Jordan and Daniel for leading us through this time today for this very engaged conversation on anti-racism for white people, for entertaining questions, conversations, and leading this process. So thank you so much. Um, we're very grateful. Um, for uh, everyone who's here, uh, again, just a reminder, this is one part of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, and there's a uh, continued programming that also continues to address anti-racism for white people in different kinds of ways. Um, one way will be through some of the daily written reflections, um, and I'll just post a couple of things here in the chat. Um, the, the link to the overall program, um, the, there's a newsletter that you can sign up for to stay connected and um, receive kind of weekly updates about what's happening, um, regular programming, and again, the book of the week this week, um, Wait, Is This Anti-Racist? A Guide to Becoming an Anti-Racist Church. 
And then just a reminder that there's other um, 40 days live events that are coming up on Tuesdays. Um, so please feel free, you'll, you'll get the links to those coming up. Um, and we hope that you might find ways to participate or view the recording or share the recording. So thanks again to all of you for being here. Thanks again to Jordan and Daniel for your leadership. Thank you to Brian for doing the tech behind the scenes. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Have a good evening. Blessings. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.